Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Encouraging you to live as an ambassador of God's kingdom in the world. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles, arms out wide. If we're gonna fear, we fear no evil. We will rise by your power. We will go by your spirit. We are bold. If we're gonna stand, we stand as giants. If we're gonna walk, we walk as lions. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, graduation was. Uh, last night, and so I don't know if I sound just a tinge more tired than normal. That's because that's true. Yep, you know, uh, those eight hours of sleep or those seven hours of sleep or even those six hours of sleep, you know, they matter. <clears throat> so good morning, good morning, good morning. Yes, we have successfully overcome the hurdle of the last of, well, the last of the current LaBerge generation that was working their way through, you know, the educational system. Uh, we have arrived at Matthew's high school graduation, so we're celebrating that. And as I was sitting there with Evelyn, who is my 10-year-old granddaughter, and Beth and uh, and Mary Scarlett, who are my sweet daughters uh, who are now pregnant with grandbabies due this summer, I thought to myself, you know, we're going to be sitting here again in in a fairly short period of time, just not very long between 10 and 18 just this just goes so fast and 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 as we're you know sitting there in the bleachers of the stadium and there's there's babies all over the place I don't know maybe I just live in a baby rich community um but uh I'm thinking all right these little people who are you know making all these little gurgly noises and and so joyful and squeaky and you know all the good things right uh they are going to be the friends of my grandbabies and in not very long, like really not that very long, we're going to be sitting at their graduations. God willing, and you know, the creek don't rise. So I want to talk this morning um, out of a gratitude uh, to God for his goodness and his grace. I want, to, I want to talk with you about what scares you. I want to talk with you about fear. What really scares you? What really scares you? What or whom do you fear? I'm Carmen LeBurge, listening to Mornings with Carmen. This is the Faith Radio Network. Uh, fear. What do you fear? I know some of you, your mind, just when I said that, you're like, oh, FDR 1933, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. He went on to say, nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror. Like, right, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Yeah. Well, he was referring to economic fear and the uncertainty that had gripped the nation because of war. And FDR's advice um, was interesting here. He went on to say that we must face our fears as our forefathers did, who conquered their perils because they believed and were not afraid. So I want to talk about what they believed in and why they were not afraid. So we're going to get there in just a second. But I want to ask you, what scares you? I mean, really scares you? Like, whom or what do you fear? I didn't know until I uh, thought about having this conversation with you this morning that people are actually out there researching what we fear. That's a little creepy, isn't it? <clears throat> but anyway, there's people out there, you know, they research all kinds of things. Um, the top 10 fears of 2023 across the American population writ large. So this does not account for, or maybe this accounts for everything. Um, demography of of all varieties, all right? So this is general U.S. population survey. Top 10 fears of 2023. Top of the list, more than 60% of people. Now, I'm sure that they were given a list to choose from, but the list had a lot of things on it, and these were the top 10 things on the list. And I don't know how many things you could pick because as you're going to note, as I read this, there's these percentages are really high. And so obviously you got to pick more than one thing. So the top 10 fears of 2023, where people said they were either very afraid or afraid of these things. 
60% of people, 60.1% of people said they are either very afraid or afraid of corrupt government officials. 54.7% are afraid or very afraid of economic or financial collapse. Russia comes in next with the fear of their use of nuclear weapons and then the U.S. becoming involved in another world war. So that's that's a couple of things right there, very high on the list, that have to do with um, the fear of war or warfare. Also in the top 10 are biological warfare and cyber terrorism. There's a couple of economic things on the list. Um, the fear of uh, not having enough money for the future. You know, maybe if we put that with that one that came second only to corrupt government officials, economic and financial collapse, like, right, the economy is, is important. It matters. People fear running out of money. And they fear running out of money. Why? Because they fear being able to take care of themselves and being dependent on someone else. Like, that's that fear. That's the underlying fear there. You notice what hasn't made the list, list yet? <sighs> like, dying. It hasn't actually made the list. It's not even on, it's not even, not even in the top five. People I love becoming seriously ill is of greater concern to us, something that we are apparently more afraid of than dying. In fact, other people dying, people we love dying, is way, way greater of a fear for us than, than our own death. I thought that was super interesting. So what do you fear? Like, what really scares you? Of what or of whom are you afraid? And those fears matter because fear does drive behavior. Um, we, are, we are driven to do what we do um, out of sort of polar concerns. One is love and one is fear. And so are you operating out of fear? Are you operating out of love? Are you operating out of a fear of scarcity or recognizing that by the love of God, there's an abundance and a sufficiency all the time and everywhere? Um, so when FDR in 1933, so 90 years ago now, when he said the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, um, he was referring to the kind of fear that is nameless, unreasoning, and unjustified, the terror that people experience um, that's irrational. And then he talked about the rational fear. He said, we need to face our fears as our forefathers did, who conquered their perils because they believed and were not afraid. Well, in whom did our forefathers believe and what kind of healthy fear did they possess? Well, he's talking there about God. They believed in God, and they had a healthy fear of God, all of which brings us to our Growing Your Faith verse of the day from Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. When I am afraid of all those irrational, unreasonable things, I, or even rational, rational, reasonable things, I mean, it's reasonable to fear some things, right? I will put my trust in you. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. I praise God for what he has promised. I trust in God. So really, why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? That's Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. So when you bring your fears before the reality of who God is, what happens to your fear? I mean, we all have fears, and some of our fears are more rational than others. So when you are afraid, what do you do? The psalmist says, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in God. When I'm afraid, I trust in God. And guess what happens to my fear? It goes away because what can mere mortals do to me? When I realize who God is, when I turn to God and I trust in God, and I realize that God's got this, I'm good. We do, the Bible says, fear God. Like there is a healthy, righteous fear of God. That's the right kind of fear. It's a reverence. It's an awe for God's holiness, his power, his authority, his sovereignty, who he is. So whom and what do you fear? And how about death? Is time slipping away into the future? Let's take that up next here on Mornings with Carmen. Time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you thought of the Steve Miller band and time keeps on slipping into the future when I... <laughs> when I provoked that question just a moment ago, I'm Carmen LeBurge listening to Mornings with Carmen. Uh, yeah, time is slipping into the future. 
Have you ever thought about the words to that song? I want to fly like an eagle to the sea. Fly like an eagle, let my spirit carry me. I want to fly like an eagle till I'm free, oh Lord, through the revolution. Feed the babies who don't have enough to eat. Shoe the children with no shoes on their feet. House the people living in the street. Ah, oh, there's a solution. I want to fly like an eagle to the sea. Fly like an eagle, let my spirit carry me. I want to fly like an eagle till I'm free. Right through the revolution. Time is slipping into the future. Um, so how much do you think is left in your life before this life comes to an end and slips into the future that is yet to come? Like, how much time do you think you have? I am guessing that uh, Alice Stewart, who was a political commentator on CNN, uh, a sister in Christ, uh, the, the, the lone person at CNN in terms of their on-air personalities who you know, defended the life of the unborn and advocated for a pro-life position because of her faith. Alice Stewart, who um, worked on a number of GOP presidential campaigns. I am pretty sure that as a marathon runner and a person who, like, you know, lived right by all accounts, pretty sure she didn't expect to be dead at 58. Pretty sure that those around Alice Stewart um, thought there was more time on the clock. How about Marshall Allen? Marshall Allen, uh, also a, a journalist, investigative um, journalist, um, again, a, a brother in Christ, a person who, in his vocation, just beautifully lived out the gospel. Like, I just love his testimony. Here's a guy who... I mean, he's like a cheerful warrior. He had this determination to uncover the truth, particularly uh, in the in the healthcare industry. He was a Christian who was committed to uncovering um, those aspects of the healthcare system that were not working um, to the betterment of people. Uh, he 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 would say that uncovering truth was fundamental to his Christian faith. I'm pretty sure that at 52 years old, he didn't expect that his life would end. Those are sort of two fairly high-profile deaths of Christians in journalism that have taken place just in the last uh, couple of weeks. My guess is there's somebody in your own community, somebody who you know, um, who is relatively young, was relatively young. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, the the Moorhead City Church uh, mourning the loss of the pastor's wife who died following a, a crash. This is Moorhead City, North Carolina. It's a coastal Carolina church, and they're grieving the loss of their senior pastor's wife. She's 44 years old, Sue Ellen Leonard. She died six days after her family's car was struck by the driver of another vehicle who was trying to elude police during a chase. I'm pretty sure that at 44, the people in Sue Ellen Leonard's life um, thought she had more time on the clock. I feel confident you could add to this list. I know that when my own dad died at the age of 43 when I was 15, like there, we didn't anticipate that. We didn't anticipate when he left for a business trip that he would never come home. How much time do you think you have? What are you going to make of the time you have left? What if it's just today? What if today's the last day you have on earth? What are you going to do with it? Global life expectancy is 64.8 years. Life expectancy in the United States is 76 years. Some of you have already lived beyond that, which means you're, you're borrowing in your own lifetime off somebody else's clock. <laughs> oh, and just for the record, you know, when we say life expectancy in the United States is 76 years, that is skewed by people who live in blue zones and often live past 100. So if you don't live in a blue zone, your life expectancy in the United States is less than 76 years. The Bible actually echoes that, you know, 70, 80 years. That's what the Bible says is, you know, is the span of a person's life. How about for Christians? Well, we count it a little bit differently, don't we? I mean, yes, we we count the years here. um, But we also recognize that life is eternal. 
So am I going to die? Yes, but I'm also at some level already dead. <laughs> like I've already died in order that Christ might live in this, in and through this life and this body and this voice, however many days he wants to use it in, in whatever ways. So our life expectancy is eternal. I am going to live forever. Like I'm just putting you on notice right now. Not because I'm going to come back to haunt you. Oh, no, I'm going to be quite busy in heaven glorifying God. I'm, I'm going to be too busy to come back and haunt you. Just letting you know now. I mean, you might hear my voice ringing in your ears, but that's just the Holy Spirit reminding you of the things you heard. What is your life expectancy, my friend? How long do you expect to live? I expect to live forever. Not here, but there. How about you? And yes, what kind of stewards are we being of, uh, of the gift of every day in the here and now? What kind of stewards are we being of these bodies that God has given us as temples of his Holy Spirit? I mean, you and I could do a number of things to, you know, quote unquote, extend and enjoy the years that we have here on earth. But even if we do, even if we do, anything can happen. And so I want you to live today with the expectation of the unexpected. And yes, live today as if today could be your last day. Because today could be the day of the Lord's return, in which case it's the last day in a lot of ways. So what does it mean to you today to get your affairs in order? What, what does that mean? Who do you need to talk to? What's one conversation you could have related to, um, to that? And if you just need a sober reminder, Consider the relatively brief life of Alice Stewart, 58, Marshall Allen, 52, Sue Ellen Leonard, 44, sisters and brother in Christ, eternal in the heavens. How did those babies get their names? Who named them? Who named Alice, Alice, and Marshall, Marshall, and Sue Ellen, Sue Ellen? Who named you? Who's your namesake? Let's talk about uh, how babies today are getting their names and whether or not you would rely on a TikTok influencer to name your baby. Yeah, because some of your neighbors, they're doing that. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. I'm Carmen LeBurge, host of Mornings with Carmen. Let us pray. Let us pray for each other today. Let us pray with each other today. Let us pray in the spirit and in the name of Jesus. Let us pray God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we pray, Let's recognize that God hears every prayer, breathless prayers, heartfelt prayers, prayers that come in size too deep for words. God hears them each and God hears them all. My friend, let us pray. Connecting Faith to Life, Faith Radio. All right, uh, how'd you get your name? How did you get your name? Who named you? Do you have a namesake? Uh, I'm, I, am, I am, as a given name, Carmen Suzette Fowler. Uh, Carmen is a name that my parents just liked. They just liked it, which I like it, too. Like, it means song or poem. I am, I, I am their poema. Like, that's so sweet, right? <clears throat> um, Suzette uh, was a cousin of my dad, and I think that they just liked the way Carmen Suzette uh, linked up together. So Suzette is a namesake. I can tell you this. I don't feel like uh, if my parents were choosing names today, they would be hiring a TikTok influencer to consult them to find a baby name. But that is what's happening in the culture today. Uh, there are these influencers on TikTok and Instagram, baby name consultants. Now, this is, just, this is just evidence that not only will people pay for anything, but that people are endlessly creative in terms of the things that they will offer that people would potentially pay for. I mean, who who is thinking to themselves, you know what? I bet there's people out there that will pay me to name their baby. I mean, I kind of wish I had thought of that. I'm happy to name your baby. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it makes no sense that you would let me name your baby, but I would do it. Um, and so hiring somebody to, quote, help name your child. Uh, actually not unheard of. Apparently something that has been around for a while. There have been websites uh, to help you do it. Um, here's the reality. Uh, it's your baby. Like, you know, take some responsibility here. This is probably not something that you want to, um, uh, that you want to 
what do you call it? Like, you know, when you hire a consultant to do something, right? You're just hiring it out. Yeah, this is, I don't know. Name your own baby. That would be my encouragement. Um, baby names and naming babies is something that the Bible actually does talk about. Um, first of all, you have a family name. You have a family name as a uh, as a child of God. Ephesians 3.14 says the father is the one from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. You belong to a family of faith, and we have one father. And then we have given names. And sometimes in the scriptures, God gives names. Like that's an interesting study of scripture, by the way. You could just look at how people got their names in the Bible. Sometimes they are named because they are the son of someone, bar Abbas, like, right? Barabbas, son of the father. Bar Abbas, son of the father. Bar Jonah, son of Jonah. Um, and so when you think of uh, the way that people get their names and their surnames, that is part of the conversation uh, in scripture. And I think that one's kind of fun. We also give names at baptism, right? In the Hebrew tradition, a child is named on the eighth day when they are um, presented in the temple. Um, I want you to think about the name that you were given when you were baptized. If you were baptized uh, as a child, you were given a name. A namesake is a name given for the sake of a name. When you think about when Jesus talks about um, for his name's sake, when God talks about his own name and the use of his own name, you, then you get a sense of the power of this conversation. Think about the names that God gives people in the Bible or the people who get new names in the Bible. These are kind of naming conversations you might have um, you might have today. Like this is just a way to enter into a conversation. You see somebody's name tag and it's it, it's an it's a name. It could be any name. Bob, how'd you get your name? Um, particularly if they have a name that has a biblical meaning and you know it. Um, or a, a name that uh, is a is a character in the Bible, and you know that story. Like you can say to somebody, "Oh, Daniel! Wow, that's a that's a strong name. I mean, your namesake in the Bible, man, he was a great guy." And you could just say to them, "What do you know about your name?" I mean, think about anybody that you know whose name is John. Have you ever had a conversation with them about which one of the Johns in the Bible they are most like? My nephew, Larry, his very best friend, is named Jesus. Jesus is literally his namesake. That has imprinted Jesus' life. And it has affected Larry. So, what's your name? What's your goes-by name? Do you have nicknames? If you're married, what was your maiden name? What does it mean to take on someone else's name when you get married? What are some of your nicknames? Where is your name written? And do you know that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Any and all who come to Jesus, any and all who come to Jesus and profess his name, have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Is your name written there? Do you know that in heaven you have a secret name? And are you bending the knee today to the one whose name is above all names? Jesus has, or God has set the name Jesus above every other name. It says in Philippians 2 that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Are you bowing the knee today to the one whose name is Jesus? The only name by which you can be saved? Scripture tells us that Jesus calls his sheep by name. Can you hear him calling yours today? John, Marilyn, Kathy, Dave, Susan, Shelley, Barry. Ellen, Helen, Janet, JB, Ann, Joyce, Tammy, Vonnie, Kim, Andrew, Peter, Paul. Can you hear him calling you by name today? 
Jesus calls his own by name, and his sheep hear his voice, and they come to him. Let us not wait to bow the knee to the name of Jesus. Let us come to him today. Jesus is the only name, Scripture says, by which we can be saved. And so let us be the people who declare the name of Jesus with great love and affection that others, that others might know that their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. I'm Carmen LeBurge. This is Faith Radio. From time to time, we like to talk with our friend, Pastor Alfonso Espinosa. He is the pastor of St. Paul's uh, in Irvine, California. And he has a series of books that um, we've been unpacking over time. And one of those is Faith That Shines in the Culture. So how is it that faith shines in the culture? How is the light of Christ shining through you and I as everyday citizens um, operating here in the kingdoms of this world? So um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a White House correspondence dinner, and President Biden gave some comments. And during those comments, he, he, well, he made reference to the Bible. And he joked about buying one um, so that he could find out what was in it. Now, it was intended to be a joke against um, the person for whom he is competing for the presidency of the United States. But it does provoke the conversation about whether or not the Bible and what's in it is really a joking matter. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. Our friend Pastor Alfonso Espinoza is with us again today from St. Paul's Church in Irvine, California. Hey, Alfonso. Good morning, Carmen. Great to be here again. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful, wonderful to have you join us. Um, we thought it would be fun to bring some headlines forward and have you help us reflect with them through the perspective of faith that shines in the culture. So again, um, you you guys remember the conversations we've been having with Pastor Alfonso over the course of time. Faith that shines in the culture is um, a part of uh, the series of conversations about Jesus calling us uh, to live as Uh, as his ambassadors and his lights shining in the culture of the day. And so, um, all right, so here we go, Um, Alfonso. Here are a couple of headline hooks that I thought we could use to talk about. Uh, And so um, the president of the United States made some comments um, during, you know, a a comedic um, presentation at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. But in those comments— he was making reference um, to the Bible and joking about buying um, buying a Bible that the other candidate is selling. And the joke was, you know, just to see what's in it. Now, to be fair, uh, I think that President Biden was joking about maybe a Bible that uh, former President Trump would be selling maybe would have something different in it than than any other Bible. But joking about buying a Bible just to see what's in it. And then in another um, in another headline, an event where um, the president is crossing himself during a rally that was um, in, in support of abortion being accessible at all times and all places to, you know, to anyone in any circumstance. And so when we look at these kinds of things happening in the culture, when we have very high profile political figures in these cases, doing things that are in reference to the Bible or um, or the, the making the sign of the cross on oneself. But it, it could be a person wearing a cross. It could be a person um, joking about prayer. Um, how do we as Christians shine as light in the midst of those kinds of um, events? Well, we... Uh... Uh, To be very direct, we shine by uh, strongly objecting to those kinds of expressions, uh, just bottom line. Um, You know, and and I'm I'm very sober as as I consider um, and somber (laughs) as I hear about these headlines. They're uh, they're they're disappointing to me. I'm not sitting on a high horse looking down on a fellow sinner um, in the president, but in my book, uh, Faith That Shines in the Culture, I make an argument that uh, one way that we can understand uh, 
the holy estates that are in the world that are both divine and secular at the same time that God has established the family, the church, and the and and the state is to understand that the uh, the family is like the heart of the nation. It it demonstrates the character of a nation. What's going on within the family brings out the values of a country. Um, the church is like the the soul of the country. It it uh, proclaims what is good and what is evil and provides a conscience for our great nation so that we do what is right and avoid that and to hate that, which is evil. So with, with that heart and soul going on that way, by the time you get to the government, um, the state, um, and the government is a subset of the greater society state, um, you are hoping and praying for a government that reflects Romans chapter 13 that God has established essentially to protect. It's now as the mind, if you will, protecting. It's it's doing its work to preserve and to protect and to promote and to care for the heart and the soul or the family and the church. So the last thing we need from the government and our leaders that we are commanded to pray for, such as President Biden, is for the state and its leaders to um, conduct gestures in inappropriate contacts, especially the Holy One of the Cross, which should always remind a Christian of the saving gospel of Jesus Christ and God's holiness in our lives, and to speak about um, the sacred scriptures where we have the Lord of Jesus, the Lord of life proclaimed to us to have eternal life in a way that can be perceived as um, uh, practically mocking, making fun of, um, doing the exact opposite of protecting and shielding and preserving, but using it in a very cheap way. Um, my my overarching re reaction, Carmen, is sadness, mm -hmm. um, and I'm a little uh, unhappy with it. And I feel a little a little anger uh, at the same time. Our our call now is to recognize this, and the and to first of all pray for our president, uh, to pray for him to to uh, to repent of these sorts of things that are careless and irresponsible. Um. To, to remind ourselves that we too are sinners and we need to pray for each other. And we're commanded to pray for our leaders. We honor God when we do so. Secondly, we need to be what God has permitted us to be in the vocations of citizens of this great country. And in this blessed Republic of the United States of America, uh, we are not merely followers. Uh, we are also leaders in our Republic. And so we have to speak up. Um, not to get out of hand, not to be obnoxious and to cause a ruckus, but to speak up in a proper way, an appropriate way to say, hey, that's not a, that's not right. And uh, we need to get it right. We need to conduct ourselves <clears throat> in a manner in a manner worthy of, of the president of the United States, who is called not to mock, but to preserve and to protect uh, the heart and the soul of this country. That's really helpful. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, if, if you're listening right now and you are uh, you are noting that um, uh, there would be plenty of other examples on the other side of the aisle that we could have lifted up. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm soberly aware of that, too. And so this was not an attempt to make a partisan statement, just to, to recognize that as Christians, we have a responsibility um, to respond to that which is happening in real time in the days in which we live and to do so as Christians um, not as, uh, you know, not as people on one side of an aisle or the other in terms of the politics of the day. So we're going to return to this conversation with uh, Pastor Alfonso Espinosa in just a moment. Um, maybe you are thinking about um, what is happening in other sectors of the culture, and maybe at the end of the school year, you're thinking a lot about what is happening in the arena of education. We want to be sure that you have met uh, the 2024 National Teacher of the Year. We want to talk about education um, as we continue a conversation about Christ's light shining through citizens in the greater culture, how are you doing that in your particular vocation? 
You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast of Mornings with Carmen. As you know, this is a rebroadcast of the live radio show we do on the Faith Radio Network every day. There is a lot going on at Faith Radio. Tons of free resources waiting for you to take advantage of and share with others at MyFaithRadio.com. Be sure to check us out on social media as well. Um, This is a community of believers, and we gather together here and We all need prayer, and, well, we'd love to pray for you. The Faith Radio team is serious about prayer. We pray for specific requests every single week when we gather on Tuesdays and Thursdays as a staff. So share your prayer request with us anonymously and securely on our website at MyFaithRadio.com, and then be assured of our prayers for you in the Spirit of Christ. Check it all out at MyFaithRadio.com. Continuing our conversation with Alfonso Espinosa, who is your favorite teacher of all time. How did uh, how did that teacher in a classroom reflect the love of Christ um, in, in your midst? Alfonso, for those uh, for those who don't know her, who is Missy Testerman? Well, Missy Testerman is a phenomenal example of shining the light of Christ uh, in her vocation as a teacher, and um, received this high distinction. Um, as, teacher among teachers as being um, an example of what it means to not get on a, you know, a um, soapbox to to preach, but to understand uh, the commandment of our Lord Jesus when he says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your God who is in heaven. And by her actions, um, she demonstrates in vocation the power of being faithful to what God has called us to do, the way she treats her students, the yeah, way she so is sac- sacrificial in her service. And she just lets she just lets her character and her actions speak for themselves, treating others as Christ would have us treat them. So those of you who don't know, Missy Testerman is, um, she's an ESL, uh, English as a Second Language teacher in rural Tennessee, and she has been named the 2024 National Teacher of the Year. And as you might imagine, um, you know, maybe the uh, the NEA um, didn't know uh, about her faith, uh, you know, in particular when they named her um, in this way, because uh, that's not really normally what they're advocating for. But they can't deny um, the the power of this particular individual in the lives of her students. And um, and then um, on the follow on, she has had opportunity to express publicly, you know, her faith. And so you can, um, you can hear her testimony in addition to all of the ways that she's being publicly celebrated um, by the media because of being the, uh, the national teacher of the year. So I just really appreciate how she, you know, she is a Christian, and she's operating out of that faith in her place of work, but she is not in her place of work constantly talking about Jesus. She's just being Jesus-y, and, um, and, it's, and it's very effective. So talk with us um, uh, uh, about what that looks like in any vocation, to just go and, and be light and shine as light in every vocation and why that matters in the culture. Yeah, you know, and I, I want to thank you for uh, giving me a new uh, term uh, G- to be Jesusy. That's that's really good, Carmen. You've you've made an indelible impression on me this morning. I'm going to be using that. Be Jesusy. Just I, go I like be that. Jesusy, like you know, of all right. the things you yeah. can be today, go be Jesusy. Mm-hmm. That's so awesome. You know, um, what what's really I think helpful is when we uh, we back up and we see that in the estates that God has given to us, the family, church, and state. There, there's a fourth, quote unquote, estate that that runs through the, the the three basic ones, which is the estate of Christian love. So you ask, how do we be Jesusy? Well, um, we be we be Jesusy by living in His agape love in whatever estate we're in. And and note, it is it is agape love. We don't want to. We don't want to confuse it with the other three loves in Scripture. It's it's not a desire love or an affection love or a friendship love. All of those are important, by the way. But the one that permeates the estates is the agape love. And, and what that is, is the love of God to save us, just his sacrificial love. It's, it's the John 3.16 love. 
It's also the first John 4, 19 love. We love because he first loved us. So to be Jesus-y in the respective estates is how do I conduct myself in a sacrificial, loving manner to my neighbor in the family, church, and state? And as a teacher, to do that is to say, these students are my precious ones that God has called me to serve and to form, and they're going to see a servant's heart that will strive to do my very best to serve them. They're not a nuisance. They're not just my job. I'm going to wrap my heart and my arms and my mouth and my eyes around these precious ones that Jesus died for and God created. Of course, again, she's not preaching this from a soapbox, but this is driving her soul. It's driving her heart to see them as children of God that I have been called from above to serve with the light of Jesus Christ. And you know what? When we're Jesus-y like that, people are just drawn to us. You know, I'm sure they see that her students flock to her. Uh, because that love is what the world desperately needs. And even if the world can't say it and actually explicitly express, I need that love, when they see it, they're drawn to it. And when you're drawn to it, that person who's faithful is just going to shine the light of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing how without ever preaching, you build those relationships and people just start asking questions. Tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. And then the Lord does the rest. Yeah, I appreciate that you keep circling back around to the reality of love. We we have talked recently here about, you know, even even as we approach um a political season and the opportunity to um to vote, you know, like what does it mean to actually like vote out of love for neighbor or vote out of love for other or vote out of love even for enemy? Like what is it what does that look like? And so I just appreciate that you continue um circling back around to that particular calling and reality uh, because the culture tells us many other things about why we work and how we work and how to treat people and um and 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 how to respond in political environments um or even to political figures. And in in all the conversation today, you just keep returning to the same theme, um, which is love. And so thank you for directing us back to, um, yeah, to God yeah. and to, and to the, you know, like right to the, to the righteous reality that, you know, ultimately love, love is what wins. Amen. And, 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 and a parallelism, I think, to kind of flesh that out. And thank you for, for that observation. It is very important for me to get back to that all the time. But what's parallel to um, love versus evil that we're actually called to hate. Christians are actually supposed to hate something. It's mm -hmm. called evil. And evil is uh, everything that is of unrighteousness or wickedness that always seeks to hurt and harm and destroy the neighbor. Um, but but the parallelism to kind of flesh it out is um, that kind of corresponds to love and evil is uh, neighbor and self. So politics um, can be about me, myself, and I in power and what suits me and puts yours truly in the best position for myself. Or it can be about love, which is to say, to flesh it out, the neighbor, the neighbor, the neighbor. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is what makes Christians stand out. If we go along with the culture and say, yeah, when it comes to politics, I'll just put on my secular hat and it's all about the best thing for me, my taxes or whatever, what I think is right, whatever. No, it's about the neighbor. What is good for us, community, country? It is not uh, when I get down on my knees to pray the Lord's Prayer, it is not my Father who art in heaven, but our Father who art in heaven. So our orientation is completely to the neighbor. And when we're doing that in our various estates, the Holy Spirit has taken over. That's Alfonso Espinoza. You have uh, heard our prior conversations um, on faith that shines in the culture faith that engages the culture, faith that sees through the culture. But if you missed any of those, we will uh, be happy to connect you to that material at MyFaithRadio.com. Alfonso, we look to conversations in the future. I, I like this where we're going to just bring forward 
you know, uh, some headlines and say, okay, let's bring this into conversation with what we're learning um, about, you know, this 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 process of sanctification in our lives and, and how we really live it out. So thank you so much. Amen. I can't wait. Thank you, Carmen. Yeah, absolutely. All right. You are listening to Mornings with Carmen. So Carol has asked a really great, um, great question uh, on the text line, and I want to um, I want to lift this up and address it here very, very briefly. Um, so it's in reference to the Bible that is being marketed by a particular individual and his organization. That individual also happens to be a candidacy for the presidency. Um, and so it's like the so-called Trump Bible. Let's just be really clear. Um, the Bible is the Word of God, and the Bible is includes 66 books of the Old and the New Testaments. Nothing more, nothing less. You can't add anything to it, and you can't take anything away from it in order for it to be a Bible. Now, having said that, I want you to consider all of the additional things that appear in any Bible that you might have. Um, unless you have a Hebrew Old Testament with no vowel pointing, um, no demarcation of of verses because those don't exist originally, um, no chapter and verse, and a New Testament in Greek and Aramaic that includes again um, no uh, no headings, no no chapter and verse demarcations. Certainly none of those um, none of those headings that are in there at, at paragraphs or the beginnings of chapters, none of that, um, because all of that is extra biblical, including those maps and that table of contents, including those marginal notes and those places where it tells you where the cross-references are to other verses of Scripture that address the same thing. So um, I understand our desire to be to be purists in, in terms of what is included in a book, the, a marketed book that is marketed as a Bible. Uh, and I have <clears throat> I have been critical in the past of people who have published and marketed um, books that include the Bible, but not only the Bible. Um, and I have uh, and and I think that those criticisms are legit. And so, if you want to be critical of things being published in a book that also contains the Bible. And I think that's the way we should be phrasing this. There is a book that has been published that, among other documents, includes the Bible. Those other documents um, in this particular case are like the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and um, the Pledge of Allegiance, those kinds of things. Um, But other Bibles include other things or other, excuse me, see, I'm even having a hard time figuring out how to say it myself. Other books that have been published that include the Bible also include other things. So whose version of the Bible is that? And are you using it? You see the challenge here, and I think it's a robust conversation and we ought to be having it. Another hour of Mornings with Carmen up next. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LeBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.